This program is proudly brought to you by Telecom Limited and Daytech. Many Papua New Guineans have been subject to cyber crimes online. But how do you know if you've been impacted and what can you do to safeguard yourself in the future? I'm Malcolm Waira and welcome to another episode of In Focus. Tonight we look at cyber safety and cyber security. Joining us for discussions we have Mr. Solomon Wesley Sua, President of the PNG Cyber Security Defense and Intelligence Association Incorporated. Solomon, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Waira. Uh, firstly, Solomon, uh, why is there such a global alarm in cybersecurity in recent times? The, the global, uh, uh, that, that's, a, that's a strategic uh, uh, the point and a question because the global uh, cybersecurity, uh, the, the, the way it is happening today is uh, alarming in the sense that the cyber attacks are uh, sophisticated, well coordinated, and at the moment, uh, artificial intelligence is already uh, uh, coming into play. So, uh, in 20, 2015, the cost of cyber uh, crime was around three trillion, and in 2025, uh, there's a report by a company called um, Cyber Ventures. They said that it will reach uh, 10.3 trillion by the year 2025. So that's how the stakes are pretty high and. Uh, uh, that is what cybersecurity is going, and uh, uh, at the moment, the government agencies and departments and all these people are under under uh, attack. So most of the most of the time, the cyber criminals have the, those who have a lot of money, and LK industry, the defense, the government departments, all that. So it is a bit alarming because everybody is going to accessing internet. So when everybody goes to the internet, the cyber criminals also go there. And that is also an opportunity. And from a business perspective, they, it is like a marketplace where they can make a lot of money. Now, you mentioned the emergence of artificial intelligence. Um, artificial intelligence has been applied to various nefarious activities on social media. Uh, for example, we have the emergence of deepfake uh, technology. How can social media users best protect themselves? That's a very uh, good uh, point. A deep uh, fake is a social media kind of going to a next uh, level. Just, just imagine the next uh, news uh, telecast would be uh, impersonated by deep, deep uh, fake. What they do is that they take the they might take the MTV's uh, uh, logo and the settings, uh, probably your face and your voice. And then the next news come, uh, comes out uh, telling the country that Prime Minister resigned might be a fake one, but they will see that it's authenticated because they have the uh, MTV's uh, newsroom and the logo and everything in there. And even the Prime Minister himself, they might impersonate using the deep fake. They get his voice and then he will come out and tell everybody that he's resigning. But that is not him. Someone else is doing the talking, but because of uh, deep uh, fake technology, uh, it will see, uh, seem like uh, he is talking. And why it is so important in today's uh, time when people need to be very careful on social media is that when you put too much of yourself outside, uh, photos, yourself, all of that in Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, TikTok, all of that, they can uh, compile it together and then they make a profile of you and uh, uh, using deep uh, fake technology, they can do something that is, uh, uh, you, you might not... Uh, uh, one that they will do the the exit opposite of uh, what what the the real uh, issues are. Now, in terms of enforcement, uh, especially the prosecutions, are our laws adequate to protect users of social media platforms? Yeah, at the moment uh, we have uh, two uh, laws that are governing our country. The first one is the one that was passed in 2016. That's the Cyber Crime Code Act 2016, and the recent one is the uh, Digital Government Act. And there's a specific cybercrime uh, act is being worked on, but I think the policy paper is being worked on by the Department of ICT. But the laws are there, but uh, from a, a detail or granular uh, standpoint, the, the laws are needed to be uh, uh, drilled down and then be specific to each uh, technology. Like there has to be one for the satellites, there has to be one for emails, servers, 
there has to be one for uh, recordings, uh, all of that. So to, to the law should uh, be, be uh, drafted to counter attack the, the imaging technology and such like uh, deep uh, fake and uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So at the moment when you look at the Cybercrime Code Act, it's not that uh, detailed. It is like a general the base where other laws and others can be headed on and then we can go on. But at the moment, we only have the two laws. So a lot of work needed to be done. So I think the Department of ICT is on to that. They are having policy uh, done so and plans and policies in place. So we should pass the Cybersecurity Act. But it is not only cybersecurity. There must be acts for different like cybersecurity, cyber defense, uh, cybercrime. Uh, cyber intelligence, all of that. So, and then look at different uh, ways that uh, uh, cyber threats are coming in. From from what technology, like deep uh, fake and artificial intelligence, as we already discussed. So, uh, the law said to be a granular in the sense that target each of those uh, uh, threats that we're facing, and uh, and then if someone goes and break what, then how do we prosecute them? So, at the moment, the the law might not explicitly talk something about deep uh, fake. It is like all well, cybercrime. So at the moment, it's like every, everything comes under cybercrime. So if anything, somebody do cyberbullying or anything, then all comes under cybercrime. But I think the government uh, will expand on the laws and then make them down to like every country has different laws to uh, to cater for the, the, the threats that are happening. So at the moment, I think the, the law that we have is not really granular, but it is a good place to start start off. Thank you, Solomon. We now go for a quick break. Join us on the other side for more discussions. Welcome back. You're watching In Focus. Now, Solomon, with the government's push for financial inclusion, uh, particularly the digitalization of the banking and financial services, from a cybersecurity perspective, uh, what major mechanisms should financial institutions have in place to best protect their customers? Financial institutions, uh, thank you. P financial institutions are the core of our country's economy. They run the uh, major uh, transactions, major the, the finance and economic infrastructure of our country. When the government pushed for the financial inclusion, meaning that the, of the 10 plus million people that we have in the country, most of them are, not, are hand banked. They are not in the uh, major players in the finance and uh, economic sectors of our country. So what the government is pushing now is that to get in these people to tap into our economic development of our country. So that's a very critical uh, push. So the only way they will do is that they will bring in uh, technology and uh, systems right to the doorsteps, like in the rural places. Places like where I come from is uh, we don't have internet in the village. Now that with uh, uh, digital covering all the other areas, then we may have, but that is through a mobile device. But how do we go through that is through the uh, digital transformation that government is driving. So uh, that's a very good uh, initiative driving. So at, the mo at the same time, when you know, when you bring those services and transformation right to the doorsteps, then also the bad guys, cybersecurity on the uh, perspective, they also bring in the, the, the bad guys are also interested in what the government is uh, doing in, in, in each of those, uh, bringing in the service right down to the, in the name of uh, financial inclusion. So on the cybersecurity front, we have to teach our people how to educate them uh, to be how to use their mobile devices because they'll be doing transactions, all of that on the mobile device and all this. So the security of the mobile device and security of all the what is very, very critical. So if we educate them and teach them on that, then what so in, in whatever drives that the government is doing on the, the like uh, agencies like CEFI and others they're doing, they have to, uh, cybersecurity must be a core, also a core of what initiative they're driving. Now, in terms of the customer, what uh, precautionary measures should they be taking to protect their financial and confidential information? That's a very important, uh, important uh, aspect of our digital life. So um, uh, our lives, we have a digital, what we call a digital uh, twin. You have your life, physical life, but then you also have uh, yourself, another digital version of you where uh, that's where your bank account, that's where your mobile phone, your telephone, uh, your computer, all that comes in. So. What you do is when you do our online trans online transaction all this, use those mobile phones that are secure. Don't use those mobile phones that are uh, like some of the like brands like Samsung and Huawei and all these brands that are known brands. All, we have to use those to make transactions and then make sure that our mobile devices are up to date. Meaning that you every time you get some data or so, you make sure you up to update uh, your your software. 
If you don't know, then seek help from an IT person near you saying that I need my phone to be um, up to date because I will be doing uh, transactions. Uh, most of the time, people will not have computers in the home. So the only accessible device is a mobile phone. So now you're looking at people doing uh, transactions and all that. So uh, from a customer standpoint, they have to protect their devices. Uh, put uh, biometric pins on, pin numbers on, uh, update the mobile devices, do the what, uh, likewise to computers, make sure that your computer is up to date. Uh, you don't run uh, old uh, softwares like uh, Windows 7 and you do uh, online banking. You go to BSP online or Kena Bank online page and do. Your computer must uh, have, uh, uh, let's say, Windows 11 uh, up to date, all the virus uh, all up to date, all of that you must do. So don't uh, go to uh, internet banking on a very old computer like Windows 7. Then you are already putting your uh, credentials and all, uh, all in, a, in a, a compromising position. So uh, in Windows 7, for instance, you know, people are already spying on you. Now they have what they call a key strokers, meaning that every time you punch your uh, password or so, then there's another person at the back capturing those uh, records. So the minute you lock out, they might lock in and transfer money out and all these things happening. So the rule number one is uh, make sure whatever you use must be up to date and uh, must be protected. So use hard passwords, not easy ones that kids would easily be cracking and all that. So if you are using a phone that you normally use your do your online banking and don't give it to your kids or expose it elsewhere because these are the things that we need to, like a cyber hygiene we call it. It's like in the house you need to make sure that after whatever you do, make sure that your house is in order. So after you're browsing all that, clear up your browsing history, make sure that nothing is uh, kept inside. So these are the kind of things that are, it boils down to uh, safety. So cyber hygiene, make sure that your device is healthy before you go in and uh, do uh, online uh, transactions, uh, like uh, transferring money and uh, paying for bills and all that. Now, from a global perspective, uh, what are the emerging trends in cybersecurity? Uh, globally, um, ransomware is one of the major, uh, major, major trends that are happening today. People are being uh, ransomware costs are staggering. It's a very huge uh, economy. Of all the cyber attacks that are happening, ransomware is one that involved directly involves some money because what they do is then they will all your files at ransom like the one we experienced in the department of finance and then they will demand you to pay uh, some money to uh but th that is one of the major major uh trends that, that is happening and the other one is the misinformation against the government and others like we see a lot of things here in the in png uh, i as a cybersecurity person and what we do in cybersecurity uh png limited or the association we support the government of the day. We don't have any like a party affiliation. So when you do cybersecurity, it's like national security. So we, we don't affiliate with party affiliations or anything because we deliver or we protect the government of the day. At the moment, a lot of trends are against the things that people are using, misinformation, people are using, uh, where again, deep uh, fake and other technology comes in. So they're using uh, this kind of information and then they're hiding behind uh, uh, fake names. So that is one of the fronts at the, the government level. People are now attacking uh, uh, any government of the day. It doesn't matter who is in power, but as long as any government goes into power, then that wave of attacks come in. So these are the global trends happening. And then at the global, uh, like the geopolitics you look at, the, uh, writing the uh, political propaganda, all of that is done through the uh, internet and technology. So these are some of the emerging trends that are happening and already affecting our country. And uh, you will see that a lot of social media posts allow to this. And you will, might say that the author is not somebody's known. It's, they're using some uh, aliases or other names. So these are the kind of things that are happening. So these are global trends that are happening, not only in PNG, across the globe. And uh, uh, once we PNG image into that one, then you will realize that you are in a group or on a, in a global uh, community where you are prone to some of this. And some of this, uh, Ammunitions are not for you, but you can, we can be in the firing line. Uh, it might mean uh, meant for other countries and other infrastructure, but because we are in a global community, we are using the same device all that, we can also be in the firing line. It's like police running after a, a criminal, but because criminal is hiding uh, among uh, some in a marketplace or so, then uh, unfortunately we see other innocent bystanders uh, get the bullet. That's, that's the same situation in cyber security. So come back to our protection all that. There's global trends happening at a very high, uh, high level of escalation and all that. So uh, I'll just take one example. Uh, the wars that are going on in Ukraine and uh, uh, in, uh, now that we see Iran and Israel and all this, 
the underlying technology that plays uh, artificial intelligence, like what we see in uh, the, uh, the attack in Israel. All of a sudden, they're firing these uh, missiles, and then they're, all of these things are happening. There's technology at the back. So there is a global trend happening, and uh, the minute the country as we go in, and we are already vulnerable. So either you, whatever is meant, not, may not be meant for us, but as I said earlier, we could be in the firing line. It's, it's good you mentioned misinformation. Where can you think we can draw the line between misinformation and freedom of expression? Well, that's maybe a little bit of a political uh, and uh, question in there, but from a, a cybersecurity standpoint, then uh, cybersecurity standpoint, use of technology and use of what comes with responsibility. Ethics is a, is a big thing. So when you are using a mobile phone and when you post something on social media, then uh, how does that help uh, another person or the country? So it is like the ethics comes in and we have a responsibility. So we don't abuse our freedom of speech with misinformation. That, that's where the line crosses because uh, freedom of speech is uh, from a technology standpoint. It's not you hiding behind a, a fake name or alias and attack someone. You come out and you express your view so that they know that now you are doing it. Uh, we see a lot of this, uh, like social media posts. Uh, some of our uh, countries, uh, some elites are coming out with their real name and then they're po posting out something. So that is, that is uh, ethical and that's okay because we know that who's writing. But then whoever is writing, you must authenticate the information. Make sure that, uh, so there, there, there are tools on the internet where you can use, where you can actually see the level of authenticity of that particular message that you want to you want to post. So if somebody posts something, then you can quickly run through and see if that is authentic or not. So back to the question of uh, social, uh, our responsibility where uh, fake news and uh, freedom of speech, I think they're, they're two distinct, uh, different things. In PNG, I see we, we may be mixing them, but if you want to post something, uh, put the right information out with the real name. And then that's the demarcation of where misinformation and uh, uh, freedom of speech comes in. So if you mix them, that, that's like you, you are violating the uh, ethics of uh, uh, freedom of speech. Thank you, Solomon. We now go for a quick break. Join us on the other side for more discussions. Welcome back. You're watching In Focus. Uh, now, Solomon, what are some of the biggest mistakes companies and organizations make when, when it comes to cybersecurity? Uh, cybersecurity is, uh, as you said, uh, as we have been discussing uh, in the previous episodes, um, cybersecurity is, uh, it transcends all the, the borders of accounting, HR, all of that. So the biggest mistake that most of the organizations and companies do is that they don't uh, take cybersecurity seriously. They think that it's a problem for some IT guy in the corner room somewhere that, and then managed by the IT department, but it is actually the elephant in the room. What that means is that it must be uh, taken from, uh, uh, driven from the, the boardroom and the C-suite and from the executive uh, team down. So that's one of the first mistakes that a lot of organizations in the country do, even government departments. They think that cybersecurity is some small issue for our IT departments and they, uh, push it to the side and let the IT manager and the director of IT or the uh, first assistant secretary of uh, any IT division in our government departments. That is the first mistake they do. So then down the line, they say that the staff, the cyber workforce, uh, the workforce is not cyber land or cyber savvy. They don't know uh, what cyber security is. So that, that, that's the big, big uh, problem that most of the big organizations do. So cyber education, they don't train the uh, uh, people in that. And then the second major one that they do is that they don't invest in cybersecurity. They think that they, they want the IT manager to look for a chief router or a switch or something that a computer that is second and uh, sold on the internet or eBay or something. But no, it has to be taken seriously and uh, uh, they have to drive from the boardroom and they have to have the right policies and uh, procedures in place. So that's where HR comes in. That's where account all the departments should uh, collaborate to have a robust cybersecurity uh, workforce. That's one of the um, uh, two, two major mistakes that uh, most of the organizations do is that they take it very lightly and they don't drive it from the top down. And then when it comes to setting up the infrastructure, 
they, in the name of budget cuts, they might say they look for something cheaper. In technology and cybersecurity, there is no budget cut. You have to invest. Uh, if it's costly, then you have to, because that's the price of what cybersecurity is. So, and then you, you try to make up or you try to uh, look at the return on investment on other areas, like sales and marketing or other uh, areas. You don't cut cost on cybersecurity. That's a grave mistake, uh, very bad mistake that a lot of organizations do so. Invest in the latest uh, technology infrastructure and uh, make sure that the, the top management and the C-suite, the CISO, the boardroom drive cybersecurity, not the IT department. Now, Solomon, can you explain the concept of a cyber SOC and how it can help organizations in Papua New Guinea better protect themselves against cyber threats? Uh, Cybersecurity Operation Center, or so, yes, as you said, uh, CyberSoc. That's uh, it's like a uh, it's like a security operation center of any organization. Like let's say you go to Vision City Mega Mall, there is a security operation center and they're monitoring all the movements inside Vision City. Who's going in and out? Who's coming in? All of that. So in cybersecurity, that's the same thing. Uh, the, what the security operation center, the Vision City Mega Mall, they're doing is only monitoring the movement of people. But what cybersecurity operation center does is, does is it is the same thing, but now it is putting an eye on uh, electronic eye on what is information or technology or systems, emails, files, everything that is going in and out of the infrastructure. So that operation center is very critical because that gives a, a protective uh, bird's eye view of the uh, infrastructure. So the uh, SOC team uh, have a clear visibility into the entire cyber ecosystem, we call it, that in comprise of all the IT, OT, all the infrastructure systems that are there. The SOC is a very a critical facility. It's supposed to be the organ of all the organizations because any IT department out there, either in the government department, in uh, private organizations, you must have a security operation center, cyber security operation center, and your IT manager or your IT director must know the IT infrastructure. You don't uh, run the uh, IT blindly or manage the system blindly without knowing what is in there and you, you and then cyber criminals are already in. Some already in, uh, in the uh, networks infiltrating, uh, they're putting out, exfiltrating files out, all of that we don't know. So the Cyber Security Operating Center is, a, is like a, 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 a security operating center in a mega mall monitoring people moving in and out. The Cyber Security Operating Center does the same thing. Monitors emails coming in, going out, who is coming in, who is going out. So keep an eye on all the uh, email correspondences, all the electronic data that is transferring in and out. Because among them, cyber criminals will come in the uh, cyber criminals, when we say cyber criminals, they don't push the door in and break in and come in. They come through like an, one email. So how do that email come in? It comes through the infrastructure, so the Cyber Security Operation Center will, get, will see that one. And then they see that characteristics of a malware or a ransomware email in there, then they can stop it. So that is a proactive way of, a, a proactive way of managing all the infrastructure. So uh, the, the, my advice out to all the department heads watching, all the department secretaries watching, ask your IT head, do we have a SOC in place, cyber security operation center? Do you have visibility into our network? Are we already being infiltrated or not? These are the things that cyber security operation center does. It's a very critical organ of any organization and either it is a must and those who can invest, they should invest in the setting up of the cyber security operation center. So in cyber security PNG and that's what we do is that we set up, we assist uh, IT departments, companies, uh, government agencies setting up cyber security operation center. Uh, if you don't, if they don't have, uh, if they don't have the infrastructure, the money to invest, then what we provide is called a, a cyber SOC as a service, meaning that we take control of their, what so we monitor what is going in and out. So it's like a private security company providing security and demanding the security operation center of, a, let's say, a vision city mega mall. That's the kind of what. So any government agency out there, they must have to have this. This is very critical. Now, finally, with the recent announcement of the government's proposed Kumul satellite project, from a cybersecurity perspective, what opportunities and risks will this project present to PNG's uh, cybersecurity perspective? Uh, thank you. From a cybersecurity perspective and standpoint, uh, the satellite con uh, connection is, li like any other connection, is a way of uh, connecting our people and uh, driving digital transformation and all that. That is a good concept, but as in any other investment, the satellite also have the, from a, a cybersecurity standpoint, uh, also have the challenges. The satellites, uh, for instance, satellite uh, systems will have a, a ground station, meaning that probably if the government of PNG, then they might be putting up in where the telecom, what is in 
satellite uh, station in uh, Gere or somewhere they put. So then, uh, beyond all this technology, beyond all the uh, satellite communication, all that, there's a computer system that is running the, uh, all the operations. So uh, where the cyber threat comes in is that, uh, the, 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 the firstly on the risks is that, uh, if the technology behind whatever the government is proposing is, uh, is based on an obsolete technology or hold, uh, then the risk of uh, cyber attacks happening because at the back of that, uh, we will have to, the government have to check whether the, the base station, the computers that are running will be on, uh, let's say, Linux, uh, latest version, uh, distribution of a Linux or uh, Windows, like Windows 11 or so, or servers. That we have to uh, find out and then if that is, up to the what with technology, and that's all right. But if the technology will rely on an old, uh, obsolete hardware or software, then that will pose a big risk to us. So instead of, and then uh, instead of uh, the, the the benefits there, the, probably the risk would be higher because the uh, base station and uh, uh, all the other infrastructure in the satellite, what would be if it's running on a old uh, infrastructure and that's uh, obsolete or outdated technology, then that uh, will pose a lot of risk. Opportunity side, you know, satellite communication as uh, our Papua New Guinea is a challenging uh, terrain, is bad, so the government is taking a good approach. So the policy, you know, some of the, our geographics and geographical uh, locations are challenging, so satellite is, you know, it can go anywhere. So that's uh, on the, and then we can, uh, that should contribute to the increase of the internet, internet uh, penetration, uh, run, the, the, the rates that we have in the country. So. Uh, it has both in every technology in anything. There is always a risk and a benefit, but the catch is that the benefits must outweigh the risks. So one way to minimize all the risk is that make sure that uh, uh, satellite telecommunication uh, infrastructure runs on the latest uh, hardware and software. Then it will be protected. Otherwise, if you put on a old one, then there's a loophole there that cyber criminals can come in. So with Papua New Guinea going into uh, social media, we see a lot of frenzy and so many things happening. And imagine when all this technology is available. The next uh, thing that they might do is then sabotage the government uh, infrastructure. Uh, probably comes election to uh, to attack or uh, to, uh, to drive some personal agenda. So that's the kind of things then. But uh, what we believe is that benefits will ben uh, outweigh the risks as always. And uh, in, in everything, the risks are there. There's no infrastructure organization that is 100% risk-free. Uh, there are risks there, but what does it that benefits outweigh and uh, the, the accepted risks are there. So when the risks outweigh the benefits, then that's where we have in, run into problem. But the manage, uh, manageable risks, we always, and even in cybersecurity, uh, there are two types of companies. One is the one that has been affected and that one is that will be. There is no like middle ground. So uh, one way or another, you will still be affected. So we have to be in, on our defensive side. So the satellite project is a good one. Uh, we just need to make sure that the ground station and the infrastructure in place is up to date and on the, running on the latest uh, technology. Solomon Wesley Sua, thank you for joining us. Thank you and I uh, look forward to another, uh, another episode and thank you for allowing me on the show. Thank you. Well, viewers, that's all the time we have for this edition of In Focus. Do join us again next week, Monday, on our regular time slot of 7 p.m. for another edition of In Focus. Till then, good night.